you know, year or two, but the, you know, I recommend The Good Place. And anyone who's seen that will know that the, the history of time is not a cycle or a square or a straight line. It's a Jeremy Baramy, which will sort of give you the cycle of the earth. And this is sort of, it's a, it's a joke. Um, and if you've seen the show, you'll find me funny. If not, you'll think I'm a little crazy. But the idea is that we don't exactly know where we're going. And the idea that we can understand or think out 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 300 years and perfectly plan it kind of closes our eyes to the amount of uncertainty and the amount of, of positive energy that we need to put into the efforts and the activities to bring about the best future possible. So I wanted to kind of close and, and get the conversation kicked off with some of the, the similarities that both the critical minerals mining folks and the battery recycling folks have to deal with on a daily basis as realities and come out with a positive attitude and a problem solving, change making um, energy to bring these things into fruition. And some of those are, you know, working in uncertainty. What kind of cathodes will be available to recycle in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? That depends on a lot of other things. We're dealing with constant shifting variables. Um, we're in an industry where we are doing and, you know, anybody in the battery material space, anybody in the renewable energy transition and anybody in the recycling business has to and is doing what we do because of a feeling of responsibility to nature and a responsibility to society. But at the same time, that puts us in a position of having to explain imperfect trade-offs to those who might not understand the the, the ins and outs or the ups and downs of what we're doing, you know, is recycling an industrial process? Yes. Is mineral extraction an industrial process? Yes. What can we do as responsible stewards of the earth to mitigate those imperfect trade-offs and work together to come about with something better than what we started with? Um, one of the, the things that's made me very happy watching the benchmark presentation was the, the, the movement to metrics over buzzwords. So rather than just calling something sustainable, rather just talking about something being green, we're seeing concrete movements to measurement of carbon, emission, carbon emissions, concrete movement towards some kind of life cycle analysis that uses science words and gives us metrics that allow us to compare different processes or different projects that are different places. And finally, I wanted to kind of end with the, the last thing I think that all of us share in common is sort of a hunger for discovery. You know, whether you're an exploration geologist, you know, riding a horse across the Andes or in a lab working towards a new recycling process, I think one of the commonalities that motivates this industry is a hunger for discovery and an enjoyment of that path that it takes us on. So with that sort of introduction, I am going to stop sharing my screen and jump on over to presenting my esteemed colleague uh, and hopefully friend and fellow U.S. South, Southeast U.S. Uh, resident, Andrew Miller, who is the product director at Benchmark to give a brief intro presentation. Great, thanks very much, Emily. And um, I think you definitely win the award for best images on a presentation. Jeremy Beremy, I very much appreciate it. So uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be speaking on this session. I'm really happy that we've been able to put this day of presentations together, actually, because you know I think the recurring theme from my perspective throughout this week has been that every session has, in one way or another, come around to this aspect of sustainability. No matter what the topic, no matter what part of the supply chain, uh, this issue of sustainability and recycling being one of the key facets of that um, has, has been central to all of the discussions. So I think it's a perfect way for us to be bringing this, this week of uh, content to a close. Uh, we have a number of experts that are going to speak on you know, the technology and what's really happening in recycling in some more detail. But I just wanted to give a brief overview from the benchmark perspective of, of where we see the market. You know, this is something that we're increasingly building up our research on. And in the first half of next year, we will have a report available on the recycling industry. 
Um, but I want to start with a few, a few key uh, trends that we're seeing and things that need to be overcome in order for recycling to pay, play the role that, that is needed um, over the coming years. Starting off, and you know, you can look across the critical materials, and I could have put, you know, a lot more of these graphs up on the screen. But effectively, what this is showing is that if you look at any of the critical raw materials in the lithium-ion battery supply chain, you can accumulate all of the production that is either operating today or could potentially be developed um, over the over the next decade. And effectively, by the mid 2020s, in each of these markets, even if all of that was successful, which it, it never is, but even if that were the case we'd still be facing serious structural issues for these raw material markets to meet the scale of demand that's gonna be coming over the coming years. And effectively what that means is that the size of the opportunity and the potential for re recycling's role in this supply chain is just gonna get bigger over time. And what you can see at the, the top of those graphs there, the very light blue bar is what we're anticipating in terms of secondary supply. Now that number continues to fluctuate and grow. And as we build up our models, uh, you know, we're, we're refining those numbers, but effectively, you know, we are, there is a bottleneck on the recycling side on a few fronts at the moment that need to be overcome so that that part of the um, supply scenario can really step up and meet this huge growth in demand. It can't all come from new primary supply. And when you look, you know, over the coming decade, we are really just entering this period of when you're really going to see significant volumes of batteries and particularly automotive batteries starting to come back into the supply chain. And that's really, from our perspective, when the opportunity really opens up. Um, of course, there's already a market for lithium ion battery recycling. It is done today um, commercially, but not a huge scale. Um, and that, that's the, the, the next step for this industry, particularly as, as it's faced with the challenge of ramping up for new transportation um, material coming into the market. And of course, when you talk about transportation as well, you have to take into account that not all portables are today coming back into that supply chain. There's not 100% of when you finish with your phone is going off to recycle. Whereas it's much more likely you're gonna have a, a much larger proportion of these batteries coming to end of life and coming back into the supply chain from a transportation perspective. So a big challenge for the market ahead. And those challenges, I just wanted to briefly go over, you know, what we see is that some of the big hurdles, I think for one, on the one hand, you have uh, the policy and the backing of this. And you've seen a lot of that happen in, in Europe has really been putting some really positive um, policy uh, um, initiatives in place. You're starting to see in China as well, which of course, and in, in so many areas of the lithium ion supply chain um, has sort of led the way. But I think you're gonna to continue to see this momentum of policy build as the scale of this, this potential problem comes to, comes to light. Um, you know, I think we're only just at the point where people are realizing the, the difficulties that, that you're gonna have in terms of really efficiently um, bringing these raw materials back into the supply chain from recyclers. So it's great to see a huge amount of momentum. You know, we continue to see this almost on a, on a weekly basis. You can see statements that are supporting this push towards widespread uh, recycling, but there's still a lot more to come in our, uh, from our perspective. And I think that's gonna be, play a big role in incentivizing industry to, to accelerate their efforts. Accelerating their efforts is really what they have to do. And the, other, the second challenge, I suppose, is the scale and the timing of this. As I showed on that sort of end of life um, graph and the, the total addressable market that we're, we're sort of facing um, or the recycling market is facing, the issue really comes again in terms of timing. And we hear this time, you know, time and time again when we talk about the time to develop a mine, the time to develop a processing facility, the, the different steps in this supply chain, which people are just coming to grips with. But obviously there's the, there's the timing of bringing new recycling capacity um, and you need more investment to be going into the sector in order to meet that, um, that demand that's gonna be on the horizon, but you also need the rest of the world to step up. And if you look at, you know, from a capacity perspective, China leads the way um, in terms of where capacity is located um, and who's able to um, deliver and who's able to actually recycle these materials. Third of all, you know, the technology, and I think that we'll, we'll hear a lot more about this um, in, in our presentations for sure, but, um, you know, there's, there's no one route to recycling these materials, lots of different technologies and approaches being taken, um, and ultimately there's no one size fits all solution. You're going to have to have a number of these technologies um, working in unison, but, but
but ultimately I think and, and something that of course needs to be overcome for this to be uh, for this to push forward from an industry perspective is the economics need to line up and of course across different technologies different companies you have different types of recovery rates and ultimately your recovery rates are what are driving the economics of your business so a lot still needs to happen on that front and from a technology perspective um, we're seeing some really exciting stuff in the market at the moment i think we're going to see that brought to market um, and, and see some really big strides um, in that over the years to come but it's worth paying attention to the fact that this is still an area that that where improvements needed when you talk industry-wide and, and some of the companies will hear from later obviously doing some great work on this front and the fourth and final point I just wanted to make in terms of, you know, we hear a lot about this closed loop approach. And I think it's important to point out that you've started to see this emerge in certain parts of the supply chain. But it's, it's, it's really important to note that this takes industry partnerships, industry collaboration. You need the buy-in of multiple part participants who have the, the ability to, to enter into this um, and are able to, to um, take a... Take a um, a wider approach to the, the business model and not just look at their section of the supply chain, but how they can tie this in to the wider recycling um, landscape. So that's the, the, the final uh, thought from my side. As I say, we're going to hear a huge amount from companies and people that, are, that specialize in, in recycling and doing some really exciting stuff. But those are a few initial thoughts from our side. As I mentioned, a benchmark, we're going to be uh, releasing a recycling report um, in the first half of next year. So if anyone who'd like more information for, on that, feel free to contact me directly. But with that, I will pass back over to Emily. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. And I, 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 I'm glad that you introduced the concept of a closed loop, um, because one of the things that I'm going to drill down on in our sort of after presentations is, is what that means and what are the industrial processes along that loop that make it a reality. So Keep that in mind if you're taking notes, write it down. Um, so we're going to move on to our first our first presenter, um, who is Zarko. Oh, Zarko, I'm sorry, I should have practiced this. Zarko Meseldz, did Mes can you please tell me how to say your last name, Zarko? Meseldzia. Meseldzia. Um, Zarko is the CTO and director at American Manganese Incorporated. American Manganese is a critical metals and technology driven company focused on lithium ion battery recycling. They've also just announced the beginning of the Wendon Stockpile Project, which was awarded by the United States Defense Logistics Agency, which is part of the Department of Defense. Welcome, Zarko. Thank you. Let me just pull up my screen. All right, so you should be able to see that at this point. Awesome. Uh, so, I still don't, I don't see your screen, Zarko. Oh, sorry. There we go. Super. We're on. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. My name is uh, Zarko Masalja. I'm the CTO and Director of American Manganese. And I'm here to introduce the recyclable process and innovation of American Manganese. So I include this disclaimer because we are a publicly traded company on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol AMY. We are also traded over the counter in the US under the ticker, ticker symbol AMYZF and the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under 2AM. Now, I really want to start by emphasizing American Manganese's focus on the recycling of manufacturing waste because it's what American Manganese considers the low hanging fruit and an immediate recycling opportunity for a recyclable process. I'll just start off with a few key points about the company. The recycling project development started in 2016 and we currently have five employees and a contract R&D lab. Our novel process was rooted from our original manganese processing patent and the process, the recycle process is an efficient safe and sustainable closed loop process with zero harmful emissions and minimal processing waste. So you're right, you, you will hear closed loop a few times. Uh, we have successfully tested NMC, NCA, LCO and LMO cathode materials. Uh, we have scaled up the process from lab scale to a pilot plan project in addition to optimization work that we're uh, currently working on. 
for example, we're currently testing the direct production of cathode precursor materials to meet the quality standards expected by battery manufacturers. Now, before we jump into battery recycling, I'd like to review the different components of a lithium ion battery. First, it's, it's primarily uh, comprised of the anode, which is your copper foil with a graphite coating. Uh, you have your cathode, which is your aluminum foil with the cathode active material coating that is a combination of lithium, uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. You have your separator, which is a porous membrane separating the cathode and anode, but allowing lithium ions to move back and forth. And then that's finished off with a, an electrolyte fill. Uh, as you can see in the pie chart, the, the cathode is estimated to, to be about 25% of the total manufacturing cost of a lithium ion battery, which can also vary depending on the cathode chemistry. You know, you're seeing more nickel now and less cobalt. And obviously you're getting a, dif a difference in uh, the market prices. But uh, our recycling process uh, focuses on the extraction of the cathode material because of the parallels that were recognized from our original manganese ore process and, and those parallels to the recycling of cathode materials and, and the similar properties they have. Uh, therefore, we recognize the opportunity to potentially benefit battery manufacturing costs by recycling cathode material waste produced during the manufacturing process. This opportunity has now gone from concept to lab scale testing and now a pilot plant project. So in the previous slide, we saw that the cathode can account for an estimated 25% of the battery manufacturing cost. But from just a bill of materials perspective, we see that the cathode active material can account for a majority of the cost as seen in the slide here. Um, and if the material, as, as mentioned, is not sourced from recycling, they can only come from conventional mining operations. And, and those do add a layer of geopolitical and environmental risks. Um, along with you know, multiple processing and refining steps to go from raw material to refined metal salts, and then finally to cathode active material. And in addition as well to the transportation and margins between each step. Uh, the, the battery material supply chain is complex since, since the production of mine material to cathode battery material is highly specialized, costly and energy demanding. Uh, and, and sometimes I feel, you know, it's, it's underappreciated in, in terms of the, the complexity of it. But so it's important to ask yourself at what stage of the supply chain is the recycled material introduced into. So the following analysis here by, by Roland Berger shows that the value added step as mine material progresses into the production of cathode uh, active material, which in this case is approximately a four times value add compared to the raw material value. And this is without consideration of cell margins or supply chain risks. This is important to note because it illustrates our recycling strategy to produce a recycled product as the highest value final product within the supply chain and in the least amount of uh, processing steps. So now following the extensive lithium ion battery supply chain, the cathode material product is now prepared for manufacturing into cells which adds another layer of complexity, such as electrode coating, winding, assembly, and formation. These manufacturing processes are not perfect and many times result in scrap material that does not pass quality control. It is this wasted scrap material that American manganese considers the low-hanging fruit in the recycling industry because it provides an immediate opportunity to recycle lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. Electric vehicle batteries are made and wasted today but we believe the mass amounts of end-of-life vehicle batteries will, be, will trail behind a few years, and as, as um, Andrew showed. Scrap, ma scrap material may not seem exciting to some, and one question we always get is, how much scrap could there possibly be and how large could this market get? But I couldn't have said it better myself, but as Simon Moores has quoted here, only a 10% battery scrap rate during battery production, the scrap recycling market by 2025 would equate to the same size as the entire 2017 lithium ion uh, market. So 10% seems to be the average uh, number used, with it, uh, used, but with the newest generation of lithium ion batteries and early stages of production, 
waste generated can sometimes even be up to 30% of the manufacturing capacity. Now, you can even see here from an example cell production plant, the, the average quarterly cell production loss can even account for 39% of the production ca capacity with even larger losses during the ramp up stages of production. And right now we are seeing a huge influx of uh, manufacturing battery mega factory facilities or gigafactories. So following a review of the battery material costs, the supply chain and the availability of manufacturing scrap, I'd like to now explain American Manganese's unique commercial offering within the recycling industry. Uh, recyclable, the recycle process is a closed loop process that's successfully been scaled from lab scale to a pilot plant project using cathode scrap as the feedstock material. The pilot plant project was commissioned in early 2019 where we, when we sourced 500 kilograms of NMC and 500 kilograms of NCA cathode scrap for testing. As seen in the image on the left, uh, this is the manufacturing scrap I discussed earlier. Since then, the pilot plant has produced a variety of recycled products with high extraction and purity that American manganese has regularly, regularly reported with transparency. So throughout this year, we also continue to optimize and collect pilot plant process data for implementation um, and detailed design on our future commercial uh, offering. Uh, so as mentioned in the supply chain slide and in the different value added steps, American Manganese has been strategic in this process management with the goal to advance our patented recycling technology by integrating it with modern cathode manufacturing equipment to produce the high, high value cathode precursor in the least amount of processing steps. So for example, we recently acquired and integrated a specialized cathode precipitation reactor that is used by modern cathode pre precursor manufacturers in order to co-precipitate our uh, pregnant leach uh, solution into a cathode precursor material. Uh, we expect to report on our results over the next few months. Uh, so, so stay tuned with our press releases. American Manganese has also tested material from third parties. Uh, the image here is an example of a sample NCA scrap material received from battery manufacturer where we first separated the uh, black cathode active material from the aluminum current collector. We then continue by leaching the cathode active material into solution and co-precipitate the base metals followed by a separate lithium chemical recovery uh, stream. Uh, so when we received the, the samples of the cathode scrap material from the battery manufacturers, we learned about their cathode precursor requirements um, and the, the quality of the material, which, which, are, fi uh, which are chemically fine-tuned to specific parameters such as particle shape, size, density, and uh, chemical composition. Therefore, to, to supply recycled battery material directly back into battery manufacturing, uh, we adopted our strategic goal of uh, producing cathode precursor material. Uh, we have shipped our recycled products to third parties for their individual analysis and validation of the material. Uh, due diligence is still ongoing and, and the company names have not been disclosed. Um, American Manganese was uh, issued a patent for, our, uh, the original patent was for our manganese ore processing. And it was from that patent uh, and the roots of that patent that we have now been issued two patents in lithium ion battery cathode recycling. Uh, we're extremely proud to say that the first recycling patent, patent was issued within 13 months of the filing date and, and the second uh, only 81 days from the filing. So it's, you know, I think we, we came in at an er early stage and, and I think the topic, it, it's, it could be a really hot topic as well that uh, you know, we're, we're uh, fortunate to get the patent in this time frame. Uh, the first recycling patent is the core process used in the recyclical process, while the second was developed following testing of ground battery concentrates, also known as black mass in the industry. Uh, this includes process steps such as the recovery of graphite and carbon from the black mass, uh, treatment of fluoride from the black mass, which originates from the electrolyte, 
and, and separation of aluminum from uh, cathode active material. Uh, so American Manganese has also filed national phase patent applications for these patents in jurisdictions that dominate the world, uh, world battery materials market. So how do we really get to where, where we are? Uh, we, you know, we saw the complicated nature of the lithium ion battery material uh, and uh, from mine material to cathode material um, and current uh, recycling, current recycling options can have also just as extensive of a, of a supply chain. So the commonly known recycling options, uh, especially for smaller format batteries is, is shredding and, and high heat smelting. Uh, which reduces the battery into a crude material. Uh, unfortunately, the smelting operation can generate about two tons of CO2 per ton of metal, and the recovery rates are low. Uh, with, with, and, and only with the primary focus of uh, nickel and cobalt recovery. So the crude material then requires even more additional energy demanding processing steps such as uh, conversion, leaching, solvent extraction, uh, and electro refining to, to finally produce individual metal pro products that are valued at the, their individual LME market price. And, and as, as shown in the supply chain, you know, there's the, the, the additional value added as, as you start producing cathode material. Then for the material to be used in battery production, the individ individual metals need to be redissolved and crystallized into high purity metal salts before it is processed into cathode precursors. Relative to our recyclable process, where we aim to directly recycle scrap cathode material into high quality cathode precursors. So the following competitive analysis illustrates a comparison between extraction and product value, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, the, for instance, like a hydrometallurgical recycling process can achieve high extraction rates. But it's also important to consider the value of that recycled product and the cost of those additional refining steps within the supply chain to bring that into you know, battery production and as a, into a cathode precursor. So it could be a closed loop, but in that it, you know, it's also important to consider how many points in that loop there is. Um, and relative to uh, you know, American manganese's uh, direct cathode to cathode recycling approach. Now, Scaling from the data of our of our pilot plant and you know a, a potential commercial offering, uh, we have designed a, a conceptual commercial recycling plant, at about three tons per day, or it works out to about a, a thousand tons per year, of cathode scrap processing. Uh, as so just the scrap material coming you know directly from a battery manufacturer. So now you can see from you know the potential material extraction from just the scrap material is almost a, a small mine's worth of, of material in, in lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese. And, and with a, you know, a plant this size, we estimate uh, a capital cost of uh, 12 million US. Now, you know, we don't have the, the full details and, and through the pilot plant testing, we'll, we will be applying the process parameters and findings into a more detailed design. But one thing that we can interpret from pilot plant testing is the reagent consumption because that's a direct variable cost. So what, what, we, what we're seeing is for every ton of cathode scrap material, we're seeing about $1,000 worth of uh, reagent consumption costs. Um, and you know, from what we've shown before, um, a, a ton of cathode scrap material can, uh, you know, that, that value can be uh, uh, you know, X, X amount uh, higher than those uh, reagent costs. So I guess in summary, um, American Manganese's goal is to commercialize our patented recycling process, but via a, a joint development partnership or a licensing agreement. You know, this is going to require some, some collaboration. Uh, first, first, we look with you know, cathode and battery manufacturers to produce cathode manufacturing scrap. Uh, the, you know, this has been the theme of, of this presentation. And uh, you know, which is seen there in the uh, internal loop, and in this in this case scenario with the cathode manufacturing scrap, the seller of the cathode scrap can also be the buyer of the recycled cathode precursor material. 
So as the, as the end of life EV battery sector matures, uh, we intend to expand our commercial offering for processing of uh, black mass material from pre-treatment processes that discharge and disassemble end of life batteries. The focus of this presentation has been on manufacturing scrap, but it is important to note that we have received and tested black mass material as explained in our second patent. Uh, so there are multiple groups that have investigated unique and very efficient uh, methods of discharging and shredding end of life batteries. For example, we have also partnered with the US Department of Energy and Critical Materials Institute on a project to advance the economic recovery of lithium ion battery materials from electric vehicles. However, the, the battery pretreatment stage may even be done by EV manufacturers themselves, and this could be done to, to protect their battery IP. And then the black mass is, could be a market where that's sold to third parties or um, potentially joint developed or, or have technology license to uh, recover the, the value in the black mass. So the, the primary recycling industry right now consists of the pretreatment stage. But with the, with the resources available to American manganese, uh, we focused on uh, this efficient treatment of cathode material um, and you know, looking for collaboration in the discharging and disassembly when it, when it comes to the mature end of life market. I'd also like to give recognition to Cometco Research and the incredible work they have done and continue to do in bringing the recyclable project from concept to current pilot, pilot plant testing. Cometco is an arm's length contract R&D lab to American manganese that has worked with the company to develop its original manganese processing patent, and now it's lithium ion battery cathode recycling process. Uh, they continue to develop and optimize our lithium ion battery recycling project and, and provide in, independent third party analytical results. And that'll wrap up my presentation. So thank you for your time. Please feel free to contact me uh, if you do have any questions through any of these links here. Cool. Thank you so much, Zarko. And, and in the interest of time, I'm keep on keep on coming with the Q and A's, guys. But I'm going to make sure to capture all the questions. But I also might ask some of them as comparative questions between some of the different processes, um, so that we can kind of get a get a. I guess a, a robust panel discussion going at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce AJ Kochner. Um, AJ is the president and CEO of LiCycle. LiCycle was founded with the vision to help solve the global end of life cycle lithium ion battery problem and to create a secondary supply to meet the demand for critical battery materials through innovative recycling technology. LiCycle has developed and validated a unique and sustainable process for recycling all types of lithium ion batteries. And if, if anybody's new to the recycling space, um, I do a podcast called The Minerals Manhattan Project, where I did a quite long but comprehensive conversation and, and, and interview with AJ's uh, partner, Tim Johnston, that goes through the nitty gritty of what's black matter, what happens to the plastic, what happens to the copper, what happens to the graphite. So if anyone's looking for a primer, um, it is it is there. So it's one of my one of my favorite ones I've ever done. So AJ, I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks, Emily. That's a solid podcast to recommend to listen to, to others. Yeah, hi everyone. AJ Kocha here as mentioned. Um, you know, so look, I think in this presentation, and, and as you heard Emily introduce, <clears throat> um, you know, I'll give a little bit of background around who Lifecycle is, where we come from, what we do, but I would also like to spend a little bit of time on the macro uh, tailwinds and market trends that we're seeing today and, and continue to accelerate vis-a-vis -vis, uh, recycling. Now, before I launch too much into what Lifecycle does, uh, just a little bit of background about where you just heard uh, Emily mentioned my co-founder, Tim Johnson, and I come from. So we used to work at the very front end of the supply chain, focused on really hydrometallurgical processing of materials, focused on the production of lithium, nickel, cobalt, uh, and much more that go into, as you heard actually Zarco described through the chain, uh, into lithium batteries eventually. And you would have, of course, heard a lot about that throughout the course of this week. 
Now we we were you know seeing in the space you know obviously this question of when evolving from an if with respect to electric vehicles and recycling you know would come up periodically as we would do engineering work as we would you know advise on potential investments in the space and it was usually around the theme of well what's going to happen to all these batteries it's a very logical question but the other piece of it was also around supply and demand dynamics with respect to lithium, nickel, cobalt, and much more. And as you actually heard Andy open as well, uh, of course, we're going to start seeing the structural deficits in these critical materials in the backdrop of robust demand. And recycling, hence, is a potential adder. Uh, and I agree on with Emily on that point, not a substitute necessarily in the near term to really help meet that demand. So we were getting asked, hey, when are we going to start seeing more recycling uh, or recycled materials coming back into new batteries? Didn't see the answer. So left to basically focus on this, you know, massive problem and opportunity and hence Lifecycle was founded. Four years later, Lifecycle is the largest lithium ion battery recycler in North America. We're a commercial company. Uh, we're 70 people plus today, <clears throat> growing to over 100 by early next year. So we've been very fortunate to have been able to really step into this industry, uh, not only do intense R&D and development and scale up and piloting, but now really jump in feet first and, and do this and create value for customers. So that's the backdrop. You know, I'm gonna skip a little bit past the, the usual uh, you know, market commentary. I'll come back to that at the end. A little bit into what's been happening in this industry with respect to lithium-ion batteries, and this is somewhat not known always or not always highlighted. So this is a just quickly, you know, a an overview of the supply chain for the end of life of lithium-ion batteries as it stands. Uh, you know, before we came along and before there's been more innovation in the space. So in summary, you've had a very disaggregated, multi-party process and this is by the way just from you know end of life battery or battery for recycling to some material back to the supply chain um, and really fitting into legacy uh, infrastructure so on the far left you know it's very common you have small batteries like cell phone batteries all the way up to uh, ev battery packs that you know in the first step are very heavily you know handled from a manual perspective they're often discharged for example in brine or hooked up to a large resistor bank, and then potentially shredded. <clears throat> if not, it might go into the second stage here, which is shown there, you know, a, a roasting kiln, a calcining process to really, in short, a lot of materials are, are vladalized, nice way of saying, you know, burned off. Uh, and that includes materials like electrolyte, could be plastics, depends on the process. And then from there, you know, from the second box, the traditional way, and by that point, as you heard Emily refer, it's called black matter or black mass, which is really the cathode anode material in the battery, that's really gone into the traditional nickel smelting refining networks. And so that goes into an electric furnace, the copper, the cobalt, the nickel are recovered, lithium is lost to a slag fraction, graphite is a flux in the furnace, so it's actually used for its energy in the furnace, and then you go to a refining process to go back to copper, cobalt, nic and, and nickel metal. And if it's gonna go back into batteries, hopefully you're still following me, it will have to go back into a salt. And so you heard Zarco describe that a little bit as well, but the point here is that that's, you know, forget even going back to a battery, what's been happening is, uh, or a precursor, this has been the chain. Uh, and this is often five to eight different parties. So that has been not very transparent, <clears throat> and we really pride ourselves on a very transparent approach, uh, but also collapsing that supply chain to something which makes a lot more sense from a first principle standpoint. So hence, Lifecycle's spoken hub approach. What do we do? Lifecycle is a mechanical and hydrometallurgical lithium battery recycler. The spoke is the mechanical part, the hub is the hydrometallurgical part or wet chemistry processing. Okay, what does that mean? And I'm gonna show you some photos of these different processes, um, but just to start with the fundamentals, wh why do it this way? 
why, why spoken hub terminology? Well, they're really, let's come back to the customer. Any good business starts with listening to the customer and what they need. The customer here is a variety of potential groups. But in this case, for example, automotive companies, uh, just as an example, say you have a large pack out of a chassis of a vehicle. Well, those packs tend to be quite heavy. Uh, I'm just going to use an example of a Tesla or a Porsche Taycan, whichever one you want to choose. These are 500 uh, kilogram to even up to a, close to a ton sometimes in the larger packs for vehicle and even in buses, of course, and et cetera, much, much heavier. So these are really heavy materials. Forget even that they're, they're batteries and have thermal and electrical risk. So the first problem is actually logistics. And the second issue, so that's the first problem. The second issue that customers have had till date when looking for recycling solutions is really around the technology. You know, there's been this disaggregated, wasteful, historical approach that's been out there, which has resulted in a cost to those that actually want to recycle. So that's the second issue, is actually what's happening once the battery gets to point B from point A. So the spoke in the hub model that Lifecycle has innovated around and started the use of this term in this industry, and it's great to see other people espousing it as well. In our case, what this does is that it gets close to where batteries are generated to reduce the cost of logistics take a battery and transform it into not being a battery close to the source safely, scalably, efficiently, and in a non-thermal way throughout this whole process to create then the cathode anode material, which is known as black mass in industry, and ours has a particular quality, high quality. And then you can centralize in a central place, the second part, which is really the hydrometallurgical operations. And just like other industries where refineries or chemical operations benefit from economies of scale, you want these to have that benefit, just like any unit operation in that space. So hence it's, it wants to be or should be larger to really optimize for economics. And you can do that because now you're not transporting batteries from Brazil to Europe, and not to name a specific country, but that may not make sense in the long term. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense today from a cost perspective, and not to mention the greenhouse gas footprint. So that's what we do. As I mentioned, we are the largest now recycler of these batteries in North America. We have dozens of customers. We're doing this actively today. <clears throat> we make product, we sell product back to the market. And here are a couple of photos just to help visualize that for you of our two processes. So this is our first commercial spoke in uh, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Uh, this was actually in the same center as our R&D center of excellence, and we've grown that into a commercial facility. Uh, this is again the spoke process. We take in all types of lithium batteries, regardless of size, form factor, original application, chemistry. By the way, Lifecycle is one of the only recyclers that takes lithium iron phosphate batteries, and we safely size reduce those into three intermediate products to plastics, copper, aluminum, and black mass. And we're doing this now actively at nameplate capacity and above in our Kingston, Ontario facility. And some of you who may know of the company or if not, uh, we recently announced that we have our second spoke, which is now uh, being commissioned and is being ramped up. Uh, and that was commenced last week uh, in Rochester, New York. Now, it might look a little bit different to you in these photos. It's the same technology, but what we've done here is the roadmap for Lifecycle's future. It is a modularized plant, uh, and that means that this whole facility, the mechanical facility, fits in six, a little bit bigger than shipping containers. We build those in a central place. The plant was shipped down whole in November, and three, four weeks later, we were installed and commissioning. So that's a very rapid way to deploy these plants. Uh, and again, we're actively doing this today, build mode, it's commercial. Want to comment on the before point about the spoke, and I, I might have briefly mentioned it, but just to be very clear, all of this is life cycle developed technology, patented, owned by the company, and there's a whole robust IP portfolio around it. Here are some photos on the second and important end, which is the hydro metallurgical processing. So what do we do in that part? That's the hub. We take in any type of black mass, from driving from any type of lithium ion battery, and we convert that back into battery grade materials. So 
So back into lithium carbonate as a battery grade, cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate, materials that are battery grade and ready to go back into a lithium battery. We ran that demonstration plant or pilot plant for over a year. <clears throat> we gathered design criteria that we have needed, prudent de-risking that has gone into that and multi-staged. And we're now, and this has been announced publicly, on the track to build a large commercial hub in Rochester, New York, that will process the equivalent of 60,000 tons per year of lithium batteries, which is circa 25,000 tons per year of black mass input. And this will be the largest facility of its kind and the largest domestic producer of cobalt and cobalt sulfate, one of the largest producers of nickel as a nickel sulfate, and one of the largest producers of lithium as lithium carbonate, and much more. And one point here, which is I'm often asking, I'm going to segue and I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, you know, what is the quality of these materials? I said it quickly, but we go back to battery grade materials. Take a step back. In other recycling industries, there's often discussion around, hey, recycled materials don't have as good of a quality as, uh, you know, version materials. In this case, it depends on the technology, but we're going back to the fundamental building blocks, back to atomic, cobalt, nickel, lithium, et cetera and reconstituting back into those chemicals. So it's not like recycling plastics, for example, which has a whole universe of different technologies or recycling tires where you're going back potentially to a molecule from a molecule. This is a little different and it depends on the technology, of course, but we've been able to go back to battery grade materials and have qualified this product widely uh, and continue to do so. A couple other quick points here, which needs to be talked about is there is an environmental benefit to what we're doing relative to mining and refining. We do see mining and refining as an important base for this industry and recycling is an important adder on that, but there are robust ESG benefits through production of lithium battery materials through a recycling manner when done the right way. And that is in the field of carbon dioxide savings, NOx, stock savings and water usage soil and much more. We've had these numbers produced by multiple third parties through life cycle analyses. And it is also a point that needs to be made that we're seeing a very interesting shift in our industry, potentially away pyro-based processing. Pyro-based processing has been the historical way that this has been done in many ways through some step. There are of course more uh, you know, ascribed GHG benefits, ESG benefits through doing this in a, a lower temperature way where you're not burning off anything, you return more of the material back to the market. So there's a CO2 savings relative to doing pyro processing. But something that's obviously, you know, often not talked enough about in our industry are fluorine emissions. Fluorine is in the electrolyte salt of lithium ion battery, not all of them, but in many of them. And it is also in the binder material that is used to glue essentially the cathode and anode materials to the respective foils. When you use a thermal process, you generate something called polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. PFAS or fluorinated chemicals are often known as forever chemicals. And they're very topical today due to their toxicity for humans. And there are very stringent regulations that have been now passed down from the US Senate as of February of 20 this, this year, 2020, and in other jurisdictions as well. And this is a big challenge for any pyro process moving forward. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And I think to corroborate that, fresh news from yesterday, and I'd be remiss not to mention this, the European Union or Commission rather yesterday proposed an update to the EU battery directive. The battery directive governs what happens to batteries uh, in a broad sense in the EU, and it dates back to the 90s. 2006 was the last update to it. This has been in talks for a long time, an update to the EU battery directive. And the proposal for the directive was announced yesterday. I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A. But there are four key areas that have been highlighted here, among others. One is around, this is really interesting, mandated minimum quantities of recycled material to come back into new batteries in the coming five and 10 years. A measure and mandates around the carbon footprint of a lithium battery or battery through its life cycle. Three, this is really important, increased recycling efficiency rates uh, with respect to uh, what comes in versus what comes out and goes back to the economy and mandated recovery rates for different materials, inclusive of lithium 
which often is not in these targets, usually nickel, cobalt, copper are, and an increased focus on provenance, meaning labeling electronic exchange of information. So this is fresh, just came out yesterday, been in discussion for a long time. A lot of us in the industry are still digesting, but this is really, really significant for our industry. And it is a fantastic template potentially for the rest of the world. A couple last slides here as I move to wrap up. Look, you've seen some numbers from the benchmark folks. I think that's fantastic. You know, with respect to increasing coverage over our space, it's great to see. We have our own total addressable market models. This is our forecast of that. One thing you'll see corroborated here is of course, in the near term, the sources of batteries is very heavily for manufacturing scrap. And some portion of that, uh, you know, the near term is coming from portable electronics. Into the future, that mix will continue to change as you see more end of life batteries come out of the market. But, you know, one thing that needs to be stated here is that this is also a little bit of a conservative basis. You know, one factor in here is also the quantity of reuse. So how many EV batteries are going back to reuse? We used to have a pretty heavy 50% of EV batteries go back to reuse. In reality, in the market, we don't see that happening as much, but we tend to be, or try to be a little conservative or middle of the road with our numbers. And yet, of course, there is still, as we refer to it, the tsunami of material headed our way. And as it relates to this conversation around critical materials, one point I just wanna make, and I can come back to this later as needed, but just as an example, to really illustrate how additive recycling materials can be to the supply chain, I'm gonna choose lithium, for example, in 2025. So this is, what this graph is, is basically the tonnage of metal equivalent of these key example critical materials uh, available for recovery from lithium batteries available for recycling. So in 2025, that number is 40,400, a bit more than that, tons of lithium metal equivalent. To get into the equivalent quantity of lithium carbonate, you have to multiply by 5.32. That's about 220,000 tons of lithium carbonate or so uh, in 2025. Well, how much of that is that of global demand? Depends on the numbers you subscribe to, but just as an example, you know, say take 1.5 million tons of lithium carbonate in 2025 as demand. To cut to the chase, that's about 14% approximately of global demand. So never before, in our world, have we ever seen this significant quantity, of course, of materials, because it hasn't been mined yet and produced into batteries, but now it's going in that track to come back into lithium batteries again. This is going to be very important for our industry into the future. So to conclude, uh, look, this is a very exciting industry. What we do, and I really appreciated Emily's comments around some of the, the challenges as we look to scale in this industry, what we do is not easy. It's both scaling a business if you're a growing company like ours in combination with a nascent industry that continues to have different variables and it takes a full team effort and the combination of technical, commercial, strategic thinking to really figure out how to tackle this with partnership. And so we take that lens and we pride ourselves on being you know, transparent in terms of what we disclose, but also being thought leaders in this space. And, and it's going to be extremely industry, interesting in the next decade where the space goes to. I think the EU battery directive update, which has been proposed, is an example of a very exciting tailwind behind our space. And the life cycle is here, positioned as a company to look to be the leader, not only in North America, but globally in this space as we, with our fellow army of recyclers, look to tackle this problem. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, AJ. That was super, super interesting and super exciting. Um, and I, I again, I, I learned from your colleague that Black Mask was not just the name of my sci-fi punk band. It is a critical <laughs> concept to understand when you're talking about battery recycling, when it comes to sort of what, what becomes the in-between piece between the battery as it was and the new materials or new, 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 yeah, new materials that'll come out. So I encourage everyone who's trying to understand the recycling concept to really dig down on, on, on what black mass is and what it means in the recycling process as a foundational building block. Um, we're going to go right on to our next presentation before we get to a little panel Q&A session. So I'd like to welcome uh, Menka Sethi, the Chief Operating Officer of American Battery Technology Company. 
ABTC is meeting the supply chain challenge by developing an integrated lithium ion battery recycling link facility. They are building a no waste, economical and environmentally sustainable system to recycle waste and end of life lithium ion batteries from consumer electronics, electric, ve electric vehicles and energy storage applications. Great, thank you, Emily. Okay, share my screen. Really excited to be here today. Okay, perfect. So as Emily mentioned, my name is Menka Sethi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of American Battery Technology Company. I'm really excited to be here today to present to you our clean technology platform um, that seeks to implement a circular economy for battery materials. And I'm gonna talk a lot today, not, um, not only about a process, our technical processes, but also about our business operating principles. And that is primarily my background. My background is I'm actually an architect, um, buildings, not computers. And I've spent the last 20 years um, working on um, the overlap of real estate and uh, policy and corporate strategy. Most recently, I, I come to American Battery Technology Company from Facebook, where I led the long-term growth strategy um, for Facebook and also led some of the supportive in initiatives such as the billion dollar investment in housing and transportation to address social mobility and climate change for all that enabled the, the corporate growth strategy. Um, the other, our technology team at American Battery Technology Company comes from, from Tesla. Our team has spent years figuring out how to uh, take batteries apart, uh, understand all that could go wrong with the batteries and how to make them more efficient. And about a year ago, um, they made the decision that they could increase their impact by broadening the scope of battery types that they focus on um, from not only Tesla batteries, but more broadly to um, more universal types of lithium ion batteries. Um, and they joined American Battery Technology uh, about a year ago. And um, here we are today. And most recently, and this gets to something that Emily mentioned as well, uh, we've expanded our team to include our new chief resources officer, Scott Jolkover from Comstock Mining. So what you'll see from um, in a little bit here when I overview our operating uh, our, our business plan, we do focus primarily, I'm talking today about recycling, but we also have an arm of our uh, company that's focusing on resource stewardship and mining. So we don't see, we don't see recycling or mining as an either or, but definitively a yes and if we're going to have a shot at beating demand um, for the material needed batteries that power electric cars and consumer electronics as we shift away from fossil fuel approaches. So there's three key problems we're trying to address at American Battery um, Technology Company. The first is, and lots, uh, many in the audience know this, and the other panelists have already spoken to this, um, it's just the limited supply of battery materials. Um, there's different estimates of exactly what that uh, gap will be. One estimate we have, you know, half, half um, million metric tons deficit by 2030. Uh, we're looking to secure supply chains Right now, and I'm speaking from an uh, American perspective here, uh, right now, as you know, high, uh, the concentrations for, of materials that feed into lithium ion batteries come from places with geopolitical, environmental, and labor risks. So we're looking to bring a lot of this back to North America where we have strong labor and environmental um, standards in place. Um, and then the third problem we're really trying to focus on is the recycling industry itself to date has um, not been necessarily economically viable for lithium batteries. Um, it's been a little bit of a, a trying to put a round peg in a square hole. Um, and uh, traditional recycling methods can often be very costly, very inefficient and toxic, um, yielding air emissions and other unintended consequences. So our multi-pronged approach, we're calling this our clean tech platform. Um, and much of this is, um, you know, focused on a place where you do recycling. Much of it is also focused on technologies of how you pull materials 
from either recycled feedstock or virgin sources from the ground. So part of this is in place, part of this is um, will be deployed um, broadly. And I'll talk about the partnerships that we are approaching to make that happen. So the first business line um, here, first and foremost today is recycling. We see this as a key way to most expediently start meeting demand for materials that feed into lithium batteries. Um, we, and I'll speak more to that in a little bit here, our extraction technologies, the second pillar that we refer to. Um, and that really does bridge, that is our bridging gap between our recycling approach and our resource stewardship, our mining um, approach. And we do have claims in Nevada. Our extraction technologies, um, really help us figure out how to most efficiently and most uh, environmentally sustainably extract the materials from the feedstock that we recycle and from brine and clay sources um, from you know, virgin sources as well. So that is the glue that holds our, our three prongs together. It is also what enables us to predict where battery technology might go in five years, in 10 years. So we know where battery technology is today and we can design recycling processes around that. Our extraction um, capacity, our technology innovation, we currently have a team in Greentown Labs in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, who will relocate to our headquarters in Fernley, Nevada, um, when that is built later this coming year. And I'll speak to that shortly. Um, but they are there to continue to innovate so that our business can evolve as battery technology itself evolves. Uh, our company operating principles, again, this is deviation from some of the technical deep dives we've heard, but to focus as well uh, at American Battery, we're not only passionate about our technology, but we're passionate about the way we run our business. And when we discuss sustainability, it doesn't stop at our technical process. It's embedded in the um, hearts and minds and very soul of our business plan. These are five operating principles that we've gone live with um, last month. The first uh, is to secure supply chains. That's a commitment to bringing a lot of the recycling and the um, sourcing of battery materials back to the United States and to North America um, in places where the geopolitical risk is reduced. There are strong environmental standards in place and there are strong labor standards in place as well. Uh, our second principles, we're deeply committed to climate change. Our process, um, it does not involve high heat smelting processes. It is a closed loop system in the sense that we have very little water use. We have um, continued recycling of water in our system. We have on-site wastewater treatment. We have very few air emissions um, and we are powered by on-site renewable sources. Our third, um, this is a particular passion point of mine, empowering people in place. I'm the daughter of an immigrant. My dad came here with $4 pre-civil rights built a business, sent three kids to elite universities, and I'm now the um, CEO of American Battery Technology Company. I'm deeply concerned that is that story is becoming harder and harder for our young um, children. And we are taking our business model because it's green, because we can process feedstock quickly. And I'll talk about this very shortly. Um, we are looking to pour that back into the community. We have committed to paying living wages to those who operate our, our factories and um, to partner with local education institutions to really increase the diversity of uh, talent coming into the STEM pipeline for jobs. Um, fourth, we're looking to green the industry as some of my, the, co um, the other speakers in our panel have mentioned here, their commitment to green as well. Um, there is a moment right now when our industry is emerging and the, we're going to use all that we can do through our own process um, our own battery demanufacturing process, our own closed loop system to create a circular economy, um, to lean in and to partner with other private sector players, with academic institutions and with the government to scale our technology and to continue to refine it. And then the last piece here, this is, um, you know, continue <laughs> ensuring that at least in the United States to start that we have a regulatory process that allows us to compete, to stay nimble, to nimbly innovate um, and this is one of the key reasons why we've chosen Nevada as our home, as our headquarters, where our heart is in our company, um, because it has an incredibly strong commitment to environmentalism. The aspirational climate strategy that the state released last week um, is second to none. And at the same time, there is a regulatory system that really works hand in hand with industry to find 
um, the best way to allow the innovation and to allow us to scale our capacities in a timely fashion while meeting those aspirational environmental object objectives. Uh, so I'm going to skip over some of this because a lot of the um, my co-panelists have touched on this, but we acknowledge the you know the, the basic uh, premise for our business plan is there is growing demand for electric cars and for consumer electronics um, that are powered by lithium ion batteries and uh, their materials that feed into the lithium ion batteries are scarce and rare as we know. So that is the foundation, of course, um, for our business plan. And we see our multi-pronged approach across recycling extraction and resource stewardship mining as a comprehensive way that we can really begin to meaningfully fill the supply demand gap here in North America. Um, again, the supply chain risks that we're trying to um, tackle in our through our business plan uh, are clear currently. And again, this is an argument right now for recycling in addition to mining. This is not either or. Uh, currently, about 5,000 or 5% of the uh, global lithium ion batteries are recycled. And to put that in context, that's about, we think, 100,000 tons a year. Um, and to put in context our scale, we are currently piloting or permitting our pilot factory um, to take our year's worth of bench scale research and bring it to market. Um, that will be built by the end of next year. We are currently going through our permitting processes. And when that is up and running, we will be able to process 20,000 tons of lithium ion battery feedstock. Um, so that's a meaningful increase in the global recycling um, capacity from, from day one. And um, again, in terms of supply chain security, one reason we are locating in Nevada and starting the United States is it's our home country. We're looking to, looking to you know, address climate change, take, uh, um, take advantage of this incredible market opportunity that is playing out. But at the same time, we're looking to bring green manufacturing jobs back to our local economies where we're located. We see this as a fundamental if we're going to um, tackle some of the societal divides that we see worsening in our current context that COVID has exacerbated. Uh, and again, um, recycling and mining, uh, we need both to meet supply or um, to meet demand for battery materials, uh, but mining takes a long time. Uh, it can take years and there's uh, an urgency to meet demand. So we are focusing on recycling because our process um, is fast. Our process can happen in hours from the time a battery enters our facility and exits as high grade battery material, um, it's ours. So it's a, there's an urgency here as to why we're focusing on recycling first while along the way increasing our resource stewardship, our mining capacity as well. Um, those, again, no surprise here, I think probably to viewers in the audience that there are incredible um, lithium producers worldwide working really hard to increase the supply of lithium, but it's a slow process. Um, and in and of its, you know, we need to find new ways to add to this so that we can truly meet global demand for the battery materials. Uh, and again, recapping the key benefits that we see of recycling, it uh, reduces e-waste, uh, reduces the reliance on mining, not that mining is bad, it just, it takes a long time. And we see recycling as, uh, at least in our case, because not all recycling is green or environmentally friendly, the process we've um, put in place is extremely green. And what that means is low air emissions, low water use, low water pollution, and um, powered by renewable sources. And then lastly, the, the greenhouse gas emission reductions, we are estimating um, that through the more efficient recycling processes such as ours, we can reduce the greenhouse gas footprints of battery materials by 25% compared to mining from um, version sources. We believe prof, um, recycling of battery materials is a viable business plan because the if you look at just car batteries alone, the raw materials can comprise up to 65% of the cost of the battery. Uh, those materials have a lot of value. So the you know there is the basis there for a very profitable industry ahead. 
at the same time, from the consumer perspective, there is um, the prospect of meaningfully reducing the cost of car batteries and therefore en enabling a broader swath of society of income levels to, in the end, in the future, um, afford electric vehicles. I, so again, going back to our, our people planet approach that at American Battery Technology Company, we really take to heart. Um, and again, to make recycling viable though, we need to start thinking fairly critically um, as we have been in our company across our technology team for years, they have a lot of experience on how to make the recycling process again, more efficient um, by increasing our, the throughput of feedstock and by making it more uh, environmentally friendly by moving away from technologies such as high heat processes. Um, this is a, uh, we had an attempt to map the flow of um, more traditional recycling processes and uh, it should outline how many different steps there are and where the inefficiencies are in the, um, you know, the process. And for example, if you only produce um, recycle to get to a black mass material, there's lots of logistical inefficiencies involved in sending the black mass somewhere else to have it refined. That's another process that has um, implications, both cost and environmental before it actually makes it way back to an OEM or a manufacturer to be put back into a battery um, process. So we are trying to streamline this as much as possible. Um, and through the traditional recycling process, there is also quite a bit of waste. So not necessarily high, high recovery rates. And our solution to all these problems is what we call purpose-built demanufacturing. And again, this goes back to the unique skill set of our technology team and the experience that they learned at, um, at Tesla in their years before Tesla and how to break down and rebuild batteries more efficiently, more cleanly, um, more quickly. And we have what we call, so again, green manufacturing process. What does that mean? That means we use very little water. In fact, when we, um, our pilot factory will require one infusion of water that is then recycled throughout. We have two different phases of our process that I'll speak to here shortly. The water is completely recycled. It is treated on site and it is reused. Um, that is through our mechanical process and our chemical process, which is our back end um, technical process. Our, all the reagents are captured, they are reconfigured and they are reused. So we have closed loop in um, a couple different ways. And then in terms of demanufacturing, what does that mean? That means that we receive uh, a variety of different feedstock types from full end of life spent batteries, from batteries that were perhaps damaged and never put into production, um, and the types of feedstock that we um, can accept are you know, cathodes that consist of transition metals, NCA, NMC, LCO, um, we will not be processing uh, lithium iron phosphate cathodes. Uh, we will not be processing non-rechargeable lithium ion batteries. In terms of our process overview, um, the front end of our process is really to take the batteries as we receive them and to break them down through a mechanical process. Um, the, and we call this phase one of our process mechanical process, the output is black mass. That is a saleable product. However, um, the second phase of our process that we are building in uh, Fernley, Nevada, is then to take that black mass and to, through our proprietary processes, um, extract the materials and purify them into high-grade um, battery cathode-grade metals that can be sold right back to uh, for to OEMs and to manufacturers at their own custom specifications and then put right back into um, manufacturing to feed into new batteries. This entire process to, can take place in hours, in a day. Um, so that ability to have a really high amount of throughput does help us have a really sustainable um, business plan that in the end allows us to contribute back to local communities through um, education partnerships through, again, our commitment to living wages for all employees. Um, and we hope to scale this so that we can you know, really increase and bring, use this opportunity, this moment in time for this market to bring back 
badly needed manufacturing jobs to the US. And lastly, about a process, this is uh, another way we talk about our clean cycle technology. Um, and again, it illustrates our ability, the, the full cycle from receiving fully intact batteries that we do not need to um, decommission to, de to de disassemble them through a mechanical process um, to then chemically uh, purify and extract the, the metals to high grade um, battery specifications, cathode specifications, and to sell that straight back to manufacturers. So there's a um, soup to nuts process that we're incredibly proud of um, that enables us to give back to both people and planet. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and um, thank you so much. All right, guys. So we have an exciting but time squished panel. So I want everyone to do their best to, to answer the questions. And if you wanna pass on it, pass it on to a panelist. So a lot of what we've talked about is preparing for a future market. And I want to ask kind of a combination of questions about what year-ish do you think you'll have the scale of recycled material or, or, or spent feedstock to go into this process? Um, at what point would you have to choose between, you know, access to wet feedstock? I know a lot of people have asked about Lifecycle's experience with LFP and the fact that LFP cathode is a much sort of more mature market, i.e. there will be more old batteries sooner than these newer uh, high nickel cathodes. And then when you make a decision to scale up a plant, do you think it'll be made based on availability of feedstock or taking a broad range of feedstock to make a next generation material. And we're gonna start with Zarco. Awesome, thank you. So I think in, in terms of availability of feedstock, as I mentioned, the scrap market is available now. And if- oh, Time out, time out. But if, if the scrap market's available now, then why are we only building pilot plants? Like when are we gonna be building commercial scale plants? You know, there's not, you know, 10%, 20%, 30% EV penetration? When are we gonna be recycling EV batteries at commercial scale? Right, so for, in terms of the American manganese process and recycling scrap material, that's not commercial at this point. But with the scrap market right now, there is a scrap market and that, you know, as the other, other panelists have mentioned is going, you know, smelting options and, and really just recovery of, you know, nickel and cobalt. And that's, that's where that focus is. And right now I think from a, battery manufacturer's perspective. I mean, I'm not in their shoes, but I think their focus right now is pushing out volume, trying to meet the demand versus right now, what do they do with the scrap material? So then that can be sold to scrap dealers. It can be sold to smelters. Um, and then that just goes throughout and back into the supply chain through more inefficient methods. So I think in, in our perspective, really what's holding us back from commercialization was first, you know, did the development of the process and uh, you know, going through the new science and uh, production of these materials. And then the, also the other is, is the financing of the project. I mean, I think we've uh, spent near close to 10 million on uh, the development of this project and, and looking into the commercial plant, our estimates are around 12, 12 million US for just a you know, thousand, thousand tons per year uh, plant. AJ, AJ, can you talk to me a little bit about sort of, I, you know, there is, I've seen all the graphs have kind of a, a, a golf club, if you will, of, of when this, you know, would take off or, you know, I've seen some of the mining companies say, you know, we do need to mine intensively for one, two decades, at which point there's, you know, availability of recycled material. Um, kind of tying in the European uh, mandated minimums, do you think that there will be that much recycled material available at that time to meet that? And then can you also combine that with talking about, you know, the, the trade-off between feedstock availability versus what the, you know, what your customers will demand in terms of an advanced battery material? How do you see the sort of time uh, gap yeah. or, or situation going? Yeah, let me, I'll come on both. So yeah, so I saw the question in the Q&A. It's a very good question. I think a lot of us are still digesting what all these numbers really you know, mean and the implications. And that's a very good question. I think our view on it currently is, yes, there will be enough material in the market globally to service those numbers and, and targets from the EU perspective, and then hence down to an EU level. 
but it's going to be tough. Uh, there are some very, rightfully so, ambitious targets in there. Um, not only around the material recovery content, and the, the mandated recycle content part is probably, I think that's definitely in the realm of, you know, right in the narrow in terms of being uh, achievable. But one thing, one nuance that maybe others are generally, you know, people don't uh, maybe know, there is, for example, in there a target around recycling efficiency rate. Recycling efficiency rate is the measure of how much material comes into a process versus how much goes out and how much goes back to the economy. It used to be 50% in the EU. That's now 65%. It may not sound like a huge difference, but when you use a high temperature process, the graphite is lost as a thermal um, flux, essentially. Electrolyte is burned off. Well, those two right there are potentially 35, 40% of the mass of the battery. So this is a really momentous shift for the industry. And I think it's gonna need new technology uh, to be there. I think on the recycle content, yeah, I think we can get there, but I think there's some very interesting other nuances that are embedded in the meaning of the new uh, proposal. On the comment around um, you know, end products, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a decision you have to make. You've seen it, you've heard a few different approaches here. You heard from you know, Zarko and my fellow co-panelists, and there's a, a few different approaches you can take. And it's, it is frankly, it's quite variable. I mean, you have this very broad supply chain. You go back to active materials to go back into a battery. You have a, a set of materials that are high purity that go into that. We've chosen to go to the high purity precursor to the precursor. So say a cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate back into a, a precursor thereafter. That's our choice for a variety of reasons. You can ask me about them. Um, but that to us is techno-economically the right place to go while managing what the customer wants and managing product purity and trying to ensure that we can do that and actually doing it um, and making importantly a sustainable business which includes being economically sustainable um so i'll pause it thank you no thank 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 i appreciate it so uh, Menka, i, I want to ask you you sort of you a lot of these um you know, everybody I think's graphs show show loops and show closed loops with agreements with with companies. How far away do you think the recycling industry is from having actual offtake agreements with companies like LG, Panasonic, Samsung, SK, Umicore, and Northvolt? I think we're extremely close to having offtake agreements and could have them today if we had our. Um, as you, I think Emily, you hit on the key crux, and I, uh, which is. Why are we not scaling factories at either the pilot scale or the commercial scale? Why is it taking so long? I strongly believe and we have a lot of evidence to support this from our um, own business operations. If we had the pilot, the factories up and running today at scale, we would have the feedstock, um, the offtake agreements in place and we would have feedstock stockpiled enough to um, for a year's worth of um, recycling for our factory if we had a place to store it. And I'm coming at, and one thing I wanted to really hit home is one of the key impediments to scaling factory construction and scaling are the permit requirements for that, especially um, in the United States. It can take up to two years to store feedstock if you cannot have a partner who already has those type of permits. It's one of the key reasons we've located in Nevada because um, the regulators recognize that there are definitely gray zones in EPA policy um, for the battery recycling industry, specifically lithium battery recycling industry. Um, they're used to working with recyclers who have uh, high heat smelting processes, which have frankly a different environmental footprint than what we're proposing. So we're kind of like the newcomer working in partnership with the regulators to figure out how can we move ahead faster? Because as you point out, um, we're until we can figure that out, we're kind of losing in the race um, to this game globally. So, uh, and my background is I've spent 20 years in real estate development, something I take really seriously, um, but we're gonna get it done as fast as we can. No, that, that's awesome. And thanks for the, the, the clarity on that. Um, Zarko, some of the questions that we had uh, relate to kind of the, the numbers that we're using for things. So could you talk to me about sort of what's the difference between a recovery rate versus purity? or sort of if you're using numbers as a contained metal or a battery ready sulfide? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it comes to you know, your extraction and what we're looking at is with cathode scrap, uh, through the initial stages of our process, we're looking at the uh, separation of that cathode active material from the aluminum foil. 
And then it's, it's the extraction of that material into our leach solution. That's, you know, your first step is, that's the extraction to the, into the leach solution. And, and in those cathode materials, you do still have impurities that need to be removed. Um, so that's, you know, you have to precipitate out impurities um, before you precipitate out your, or co in our case, co-precipitate the base metals. Um, and then that, that'll come to, you know, the effect of recovery of uh, the different components in there. So if, for an NMC, we leach in uh, and a, a nickel, manganese, cobalt, and lithium into solution. Uh, we precipitate out any impurities. And then finally, the precipitation of, of our, uh, the base metals and the lithium. Uh, when it came to the example on the, I, I saw that question on there when it came to the example of the commercial plant, what that was showing was the potential extraction of, you know, if you're looking at NMC 111, or I think that was a combination of 111, 622, 811, it kind of averages out there. But that's how much, how much of that lithium, chemical, nickel, manganese, and cobalt is within, you know, a thousand tons of cathode scrap material. Um, and that's the potential extraction of it. Now, at what form is it, is it extracted as, whether that's a cathode precursor, or if you were to extract it as individual metal salts, uh, that would be roughly around the, the amount that's available in, in that amount of cathode scrap. AJ, a lot of the questions kind of were around new fans for my sci-fi punk band, Black Mass. Can you give us just kind of an overview of what Black Mass is? And then on top of that, kind of jumping off of Menka's comment, how much of the sort of, I guess, how many interim products are there between, you know, physically smashing up whatever is in my cell phone? Uh, and then what goes into each of your sort of processes? And does any of it have to be, you know, exported from the U.S. and then re-imported to the U.S.? Or are we going to buy trash from China? Loaded question as always. <laughs> so it's so, okay. Let me start with what black mass is, then I'll get to the supply chain part. Okay, so black mass is really the cathode and the anode in the battery. Very creative recycling industry term. Actually, many people may not know where the derivation of it comes from. It comes actually from the alkaline battery industry, where what they create when they shred a battery, alkaline, by the way, I mean double AA, A, triple A batteries. When they shred a battery in that industry, it creates a similar black powder. It's called very creatively black mass. So it's actually a common name. Uh, so in our industry, the cathode anode material- Not COVID. <laughs> is, is uh, you, know, you know, both black powders from the active materials ends from the cathode and the anode. So that's why it's called black mass. That's really what it is. Now, honestly, <clears throat> I'm not a huge fan of the word, uh, but it's what it's called. Um, so that's what that is. Now, the reason why that's of such focus is when you have the two active materials, and you look at the valuable materials in the actual cell or a battery or a pack, it's really in the cathode, right? And of course your anode is typically graphite, but of course we can talk all day about that. And that's why that becomes the focus because from an economic recovery standpoint, that's really the driver of, of that. Now in terms of localization of supply chains and how disparate this is gonna be going forward and, and things going different places, look, our plan and what we're doing here is to localize that. And the whole point of the spoken hub model is to one, get close to where batteries are being produced to generate them into a product, de-risk it partially from being a battery with risk into a commodity, a, a product. And second, then be able to centralize the hydrometallurgical processing to create enough quantity of those lithium nickel cobalt end products that'll actually matter from an offtake um, standpoint. So where can that happen? In our plan, it is centralized you know, in a region. So say we have the US, we have a plan for a hub, there are a plan for well, the existing spoke and potentially more. Uh, so that's the, that's the way that we're approaching it. I think it's hyper critical. The thing we're obviously missing, taking a step back in the US are other things like precursor production, cathode production. So we'll get there, but for the recycling node, I can say that this is the track that we're on is to localize it. It's not the way it is today, that's the way that we're, we're moving forward as life cycle. Cool. So we've got one more question and I'm going to give this to Menka. And in the interest of time, I drew a little chart here. So if we were to say what percentage of the battery recycling process in terms of cost is reagents and what percentage is energy? 
Ah, that's a good question um, that I, I would have to have our technical team get back to you on. on ter I can say this on energy. Um, ours is extremely low because our energy will be uh, sourced from on-site solar um, production. And in terms of reagent um, use, can't give you a dollar amount today. I'm happy to you know, get back to you on that. However, I can say that in our the set, uh, we're trying to minimize that cost through our um, basically recapturing, reconfiguring, and reusing the reagents in our process so that we can reduce how much we actually have to buy. So it's something we're looking at very purposefully. Great. Well, listen, we have finished just on the nose. So I want to really thank all the panelists. This was really fun. Um, I had a really good time learning about battery recycling. Um, and I, I look forward to hopefully doing this in person someday soon uh, because Zoom kindergarten is what it is. So um, the last and final session of Benchmark Week starts in 20 minutes. So take a break, stretch your legs, and uh, get back on the, the Zoom to close out an awesome week. Thank Thanks you so all. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.